It's good to see everyone this morning. Little crisp in the air, and it falls here. Um, I I think the forecast says no snow this winter. That's <laughs> John's really excited about that. That song is a good reflective song that asks a penetrating question. If we are indeed the body, then it must mean something, right? And uh, there are a couple of scenarios that was painted in the song, and, and I hope that as we reflect on being the body of Christ, uh, that we are not found wanting uh, when a stranger walks in or someone who is lonely and depressed that walks in our midst, that indeed we help to heal uh, with our hands and that our arms are indeed reaching out and, and uh, there's just so many things that we can do. And one of the things that we've talked about in this congregation, when we sing songs, that those words actually mean something and we are emoting what those words are saying as we are singing. We're going to continue our series on the church. Of course, we talked about how there today the definition of church is one with a small C talking about a building or an edifice. And uh, but what, we're, what the Bible actually talks about is a faith that, of a community of believers, big C. And that's what the New Testament was referring to when it talks about the church. And the first week we talked about that we are indeed the body of Christ and the whole essence as we look at our bodies that it works in unison. And the time that one part of the body says that I am more important than you and ceases and wants to secede, if you will, from the body and say, I want to be a hand by myself. <laughs> and I want to be an ear by myself. That's really... A really stupid statement, right? Because we, we all function as a body. And that's what the whole idea of being this metaphor for the body in how we function. And seemingly with the naked eye, or shall I say even the uninformed eye, we can look at some parts of the body and think, why are they getting all the food? Remember we talked about that, the stomach was saying, hey, and only to realize that actually that feeds into other parts of the body and it makes it function as a whole. And that is indeed how we want to function as a church, using the human body as understanding how we ought to function. And there's a real equality, but you will find that as some metaphors are used in the Bible, it is not by any stretch of imagination exhaustive in the sense that there are, it doesn't quite describe all that it is. And the idea of a metaphor is that it paints a picture and it gives you an idea what we're talking about. And things that have what's called associated commonplace, meaning that we use that, that idea and you understand exactly what we're talking about. And one of my roles and responsibilities, of course, is to unpack some of that in the context of the New Testament. And when these things are used, what is the context of it? And so that we can be educated a little bit more, and then we can be informed a little bit more. Hopefully I do a good job and don't completely wreck your faith. Amen. Uh, that rather you're inspired and you're encouraged to say, okay, this is who I am. And this then is how I need to act. This is how I need to function and so on and so forth, right? And so that's the whole idea of, uh, uh, of doing this series. And so we want to be a church. When we talk about a church, what are we talking about? Okay, we want to understand very clearly what that nomenclature is all about. And throughout the next few years, maybe decades, we're going to examine so we can do, we're going to do some biblical exposition on books and we're going to do some study in characters and we're going to study on uh, uh, um, often used phrases, but we want to understand what those really mean. I mean, some metaphors that are used now, we sometimes use it, but we don't even know what it means. Like, for example, 
We understand the whole context, but we can't explain it. Like, it's raining cats and dogs. Like, what, what does that mean, right? Uh, I, I mean, uh, or ra it's ra it means raining a lot, right? But where did that first come from? So my point is, is there's some metaphors that are used that somebody's got to explain it for you to understand. That's what we want to do because we're a Bible church. We want to talk about that. Then we talk about the idea that the church is a temple. And how in the New Testament times, uh, there was maybe even a question of legitimacy. Because they were meeting in caves and uh, underground in homes. I mean, and then you saw these beautiful temples. And, 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 and I mean, are we legit? I mean, why are we, why are we meeting here? And Paul writes, and, uh, and the, the Bible does an unbelievable job unpacking that we actually, the fulfillment, what Christ has done in us being able to enter into the Holy of Holies, not just periodically, but perpetually. It's phenomenal that there's not a veil anymore. And that even as a building has stones in it, and, and then there's a cornerstone, and that we all have a role in figuring out how this, this, this temple is used in this beautiful imagery, and it brought about legitimacy, a lot of, it brought about an idea of importance, and the, and the whole biblical theme of, of where God meets with its people in the temple, and how God meets with sinners, and how it all culminates in the temple, ultimately, in Christ and and how that theme ran throughout the scriptures and when I don't know about you when I read the scriptures and see how they are woven so tightly but together it just inspires my faith in how God has authored this book and helps us to understand uh, exactly how he works so today we are going to talk about the church being a family all right, so let's go ahead and open up in our Bibles. But I'm going to warn you, even now, all metaphors, like I said, can sometimes be taken to the wildest extremes. Sometimes, actually a lot of times, it is not complete in that, in that it doesn't quite all talk about what we're trying to accomplish. I'll give you an example. The church being a temple or the church being a body doesn't really quite address a mission. What are we trying to accomplish? Because when we talk about a body, we're just trying to survive and how we function together. Or as a temple, hey, this is a beautiful structure and how it all happens. But so I, I think it's very important that if we're going to be a church that is representative of the scriptures, that they're all facets of it. And we'll talk about that aspect. But when we look at a family, for example, it is not exhaustive in its description of how we ought to be, but it gives us another picture of what we ought to be. And yet sometimes we can have a disposition about a family, and depending on how you have raise the family, you can have a different thought. I'll, I'll give you an example. My wife and I um, have three children ranging from ages 31 to 22. Yes, I had my first child when I was six, but the point remains, <laughs> I'm not sure, John, what was so funny about that? I don't I see, all right. <laughs> um, and, um, and, I can tell you this, my oldest son is going to get married in a few months. And Janu in January 30th, all three of our children would have been married in a 13-month in period. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. But I am telling you, it's so awesome. So awesome. Great season in our life right now. And, um, and they're going to get, in January, they're getting married in Miami. How dare them? get married in a warm place. Um, I guess I'm going to have to go and <laughs> leave Ottawa in January and, 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 uh, and bear the burden of Miami in, in, in January 30th. Anyways, I digress. But I can tell you this. When my kids were younger, and my perception of a family, and my hold, and my fallacy about controlling my family, um, 
was different than it is now. As a matter of fact, I remember as a parent how I wanted to control even the behavior of my children. A lot of times I had, unfortunately, behavior modification instead of shepherding the heart. And I tried to have them behave properly as opposed to having the right heart and having the right behavior. But this is not a parenting class, we'll do that another time. But the whole idea is now I realize as my kids have gone, it is a glorious thing for me not to have control over their lives. As a matter of fact, a healthy independence is what you want. I, I, you don't want to have control. I don't even have any desire to, to have my kids ask me about anything if they don't want to. Not because I don't want to help, of course I do. They, might, they will always be my children. But it is my goal and desire that they are so independent in their faith and in their thinking that they feel, hey, I can do, my parents have taught me what, and I can go out on my own. And so that idea of a family, and so me, when I, when I wasn't married was different, when I had children, it got a little different, when, it got, when they got, became teenagers, uh, it became a little different. I thought, man, I could control them. I, that, well, these people who can't control the kids, what's wrong with them? <laughs> Only to realize, whoa. And then as they get older, whoa. And it's the most glorious thing when your kids now are getting on to their life and they're so, they have independent thoughts, they have independent actions, they have their independent faith, and now when we get together, it is unbelievable. And it's amazing now. I have no desire to, to actually control my kids or even want to give them input, yet my kids call me all the time. And they say, Dad, what do you think about this? A couple of days ago, my son's going to be teaching at midweek. He says, Dad, this is the concept I want to teach you. What do you think about it? Hey, hey, how do you think I can shape this? Or, hey, this is what's going on in my marriage, Dad. How can, what do you think about this? How do I handle this? And it's like, who is this kid? Who are these kids? I mean, so I say that to say, when you are a family, and depending what stage you're in, there is a different disposition that you have and there's a completeness as your family. Now my kids are all gone from the home. And I long to see them. I long to see them when they come home. It wasn't always the case, but that's a different story for another time. But my idea now of healthy independence, growing up and making decisions, not about control, but actually about seeing them flourish on their own is a beautiful thing. Oftentimes, depending where you're at, and I know as a minister, and I see as young ministers now, they talk about the church being a family, and because that's the way they are in shepherding their family at their point in time, it's a little bit more control than it really ought to be as someone who has walked through that journey in their life and realized, wait a minute, that's not necessarily the most mature disposition he was only speaking from his vantage point. And so that's the idea, that's what I mean. Sometimes we can take this family thing a little too far, right? But it's important for us to talk about this idea of family uh, in an unadulterated uh, fashion. In other words, it's not what I would like for it to say, but to do due diligence, what does the Bible actually say about being a family? All right, so we'll, we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. Hopefully that paints a picture for you of what we're trying to accomplish. So in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and you will find this at times, right, where, um, where there are a lot of comparisons or metaphors that's used that is more than one to describe the same thing. Um, the song by the Temptations, it just came to my mind. Um, you know, you're so smart, you could have been a school book. Right? You know that one, right? Uh, 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 you're so sweet, you could have been some honey. Uh, and, and so the, there's a whole bunch of words that are used, a lot of comparisons used to just to describe a relationship. 
sort of like this. So in this Ephesians uh, thing, there are a bunch of um, there are a bunch of description that they mixes some metaphor, so to speak, and you'll see what I'm talking about. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, it says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. whole bunch of metaphors here. Talks about the idea, there's a little bit of immigration metaphor, right? It says, hey, when you get into a new country, I know we have someone visiting from Jamaica here today, and, and it's like when you come in and you come into Canada, right? You, there, if you're Canadian, you go into a different lane than if you're just visiting. Because they ask you a whole bunch of questions. I love when I come back home. I remember when we lived in the States for 17 years, even though we had a green card, we were not US citizens. We would have to go in different lines. And they'll ask us a bunch of questions, even though we've traveled like innumerable times. When I come to Canada, on the other hand, I just show them my password. You know what the words that they say? Welcome home. And I said, awesome, fire up. This is my home. It's great. Welcome home. The Bible says the idea is that you are no longer a foreigner and an alien, but you are fellow citizens in God's household. Okay? And that's the idea of the, that, that we're a family. And God himself is the head of this household. You remember in the book of Mark, when they had accused Jesus of being out of his mind, that he was crazy. And what did Jesus say? Here, whoever does the will of my father are my brothers and my mothers and my sisters. And so the idea is that there is a family concept within the church. And so sometimes we may use the word brother or we may use the word sister. Most of the time we do that, it's not because we've forgotten their names. <laughs> Most of the time, okay, all right. Embarrassingly, sometimes we do, all right? And we say, brother, and we're having this conversation, and we're racking our mind. What is his name for the love of God? What is her name? All right, and, and, but, but we call that affectionately, this is my mother, this is my brother, this is my sister, and the idea of a family. Thanksgiving is coming up. We are going to have a family time, meeting uh, with my brothers and my sisters and my family, and, and our son is gonna join us, that's pretty awesome, him and his wife. And, um, and so uh, we're gonna have a great time together. Here's one of the challenges. If you don't come from a family to, in this day and age that it is a glorious thing to get together, this image in your mind can be a little twisted. In other words, if you come from an abusive home, you can't conceptualize a loving father. It's hard at least. Or if you come from a home where is always fighting with the brothers and sisters, and there's just an, a concern and a rivalry and a big competition, it's hard to conceptualize and we bring that idea into the church and perhaps that's the way we treat each other. I can do without him. I can do without her. Or one of the ways we may react to the church being a family, that's a nice thought. But to feel it, it's harder, especially since we come from broken homes. If we do. 
You know, more than 65% now of people in the United States and Canada who were born, were born outside of wedlock. The idea of this family is a foreign concept. But when you come into the church, it's described as a family. And so one of the warnings, one of the things for us to think about is not always to use our experience as the absolute objective truth on what is going on here because we all have trauma in some areas. We all have pathology in some areas of our life that can bring about a distortion. That's the idea of fallen man. We are fallen people. We're sinners. Thanks be to God that he rescued us. And so we come in here and we open up the, the perfect mirror, that is the Bible, to help us to understand what is God's intention when he's talking about the family. You know, I have Melanie's parents. I call them mom and dad because they are mom and dad. They live with us. A lot of people have asked me, what's it like to live with your in-laws? <laughs> and, and I said, do you have time? Let me, let's, no, I don't stand that. <laughs> Not all the time. At, no, I'm just kidding. I, it's awesome. I love Peter and Beulah. I love being with them. It is not at all, at all a problem. It is fantastic. But I'm not sure I would have had that disposition if I was not renewed in my mind as to what a family is all about and what love is all about. I'm not sure that they would have the same disposition towards me. Because the first time I met mom, her first words without saying anything, what are your intentions with my daughter? <laughs> Not I. How are you, young man? And I paid for the dinner. That was the worst part about it. I remind her about that all the time. Melanie, her face firmly planted in her hands. Mom, what are you doing? Peter nodding, uh, 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 Beulah, ask him this, ask him that. Oh, you know, why don't you ask me yourself? <laughs> but the idea is, is that I think we've got to be careful when we have the idea of a family and what it partially entails. I mean, when we think about a family, a healthy functioning family, I'll tell you this, there is zero competition, and I mean zero, yeah. and I mean I actually want my kids to do better than I have ever done in any area of my life, any area. When I hear that my brother or my sister, and certainly my parents, something happening in their life. I, the question that comes to my mind is, why doesn't that happen to me? No! It's like, man, let's celebrate that. That is awesome. That is fantastic news. Let's celebrate. Let's kill the fatted calf. And let's just have a time of celebration. When something happens in your family that's good, it's a reason, it's a big excuse to celebrate. And that's what the scripture talks about in terms of when you meld the two metaphors. You've got to be careful when you do that. It says when one part rejoices, every part rejoices. But I'm afraid, I wonder if that's the way it is with us all the time when we think about what's going on in someone's family. You know, when my mom or my brother or my sisters or whatever invite me over to their house, the first thought that comes to my mind is not, what, it, what did I do? What do we got to talk about? <laughs> and yet sometimes in our family dy dynamics here, that's what we've got to be mindful of and overcome these things. The idea of the church being a family. We're heading out 
And I asked my sister, what can I bring? And you know what the often response is? Nothing. We just want you to come. But I insist, what can I bring? How can I help? What can I offer? Can you imagine? Can you imagine in our relationships that both of us are in a friendly race of what can I do? What can I do? Some of the boys came over yesterday to watch football. We had about seven, eight guys there. Some of the guys, man, never came over. He didn't come at me empty-handed, nor did I expect him to. I expected him to come empty-handed, but he didn't. He brought some stuff. He says, man, what can I do? What can I bring? That's a family. And that's not, by the way, a challenge of those who didn't. Not at all. I, I insisted. But the whole idea is like there's an insistence on both sides to say, what can I do? You know, if one train is going, if one train is stopped and the other train is moving fast, the force that is created is much less than when two trains are coming together. Right? Math, physics just say that. That's the same idea. Can you imagine we're all in a race to think about how we can encourage one another, how we can spur one another, how we can serve one another. How can we do this? And there's an idea of there is a forethought when we come in to worship. I remember I had gone to church almost all my life. And I came in, what time did it start? Okay, I'm going to come in because I hated being late. How great I are, right? Um, and so I will come in one minute before it starts. Not giving a thought about what needs to be done. Because I didn't view the church as a family. What can I do? What can I get? What can... And so the idea is, so this is not just, guys, an ideal. When God talks about the church being a family, and I don't, I really don't have some kind of something eating at me at all. But it's for your own good that we don't come into this idea of a family being a spectator. That's the metaphor that we have a lot today for sporting events. Some people have described it as that. It's like a football game where a lot of people are watching a few people doing a little bit of work and they enjoy and they clap and they do a good job. And that's sometimes that's the metaphor that we have in our minds. Look, wow, he's running real fast. Awesome! Or a sports entertainment. Yeah, what are, what are they going to do for us today? And there's this almost this mentality. And I'm just saying this because that's not the intention of the scriptures of church when the Bible describes it. That there is a forethought. The Bible tells us, let us encourage one another. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That tells me there's forethought when we come in. And there's a consideration. Hey, what does Petrina need? Remember the last time I talked to her, she was going through this. Do I need to get her something? Oh, I remember Jonathan. Man, he's going to a new school. How can I encourage him? Or Steve just graduated. And he always needs to eat. I'm not challenging, isn't that true? I'm not challenging gluttony or anything like that. I'm just making a statement. 
No, but the whole idea, what, what do these students need? They're just starting out. Do they need a family to be a part of? How, let me invite some of them to my house for, for lunch. They look hungry. And, I, I, but you can extrapolate it, but what we're talking about, hey, this person just moved in. What do they need? What help do they need? This person's going through physical, this physical thing in their life. And so we think about this thought. And it can't be a football game where there are 22 guys that are running on the field and some people are blocking and some people are running and some people are catching and the rest of us are like, yeah! I'll even pay to come and watch. And so we think sometimes, hey, if I give money to the church, that's enough. And we see this as a sporting event and not as a family. And so that's the idea. And so we want to change this aspect. Of course, we got to be careful when we talk about the church being a family because it's not exhaustive, like I said. Because sometimes what happens with a family, we have family time, right? I remember when, when we would have family, we'd close the doors, turn off the phones. Nobody comes in. This is family time. So we can, we, can, we can take that example and just take it to the nth degree to the point where it doesn't apply. You know what I'm saying? Well, the church is a family, and so this is what we knew. Or as a church, man, we're just going to take care of our own. And the girl that walks in, or the man who is a visitor and he comes in, I appreciate Edward. Edward just is visiting from Venezuela. said to me last week, I'm going to come back. He says, I want to make this my home church as long as I stay here. I said, I am so glad you guys have welcomed him so much that he feels that way. That's awesome. Sandra comes in from, from India just a few days ago. She comes here. See, Steve, he's shouting because he's hungry. That's, that's. Sandra comes and she comes to this campus devotional and, and we hear her sing. We said, man, uh, participate. How, how, can, how can we get you involved? I love it. Yeah. We, wanna, we want people when they come in to feel, man, this is a family. And it's just not a euphemism because the Bible says so when we use it. We, it's actually how we feel and there are times we fall short. Please, and I know what happens in situations like this. There are some people who at times feel lonely or sometimes somebody rejects them and they say, you see, I, you guys need to listen to this. No, we're not talking to you guys. We're talking to me and to you. I mean, when, when there's a struggle in my family, I don't, or, or, or someone's not, I don't say, what is wrong with you? How can I help? What do I need to do? Granville takes that a little too far. He comes to my house too often, but that remains, that's another discussion that we need to have about that. Granville walks in the house yesterday. Okay, Tony, what needs to be done? Dude, just come on in, man. I don't care what needs to be done. Just come on in. Let's have some fellowship together. But when you're part of a family, but here's, here's the idea, right? See, I'm, I'm the minister. I generally don't have a problem with people wanting to help me. But I'm not the one that needs the help. It's the other people. I'm the presentable part, at least mostly presentable, okay, as the scripture says. And so there's not this idea of inequality in the scriptures. On most occasions, I am okay. Most occasions. And I know a lot of people here, Tony, man, we, we, we want to help you so that you can do your job effectively. And I super appreciate that. But let's conceptualize this family. You know, the funny thing is, so I'm the youngest of seven children. 
And so that's why I'm going to use this family thing to, to help you to understand how this all, a lot of this all works, right? So I'm the youngest of seven children. Some of you may not know this, but I, I have been in the ministry for a while. And so on my journey had taken me to many places. One of them, I, I was um, what we call the lead minister for the church in Toronto, helping to oversee all the churches in Canada. That was a significant responsibility. Then we moved to the Midwest, and, and that church in Toronto was 1,600 at that time, and the church in Chicago, when we moved there, was about 2,300 disciples. We had about 60, 70 people on staff, and we oversaw all the Midwest. My point is this. A lot of people looked at Tony and Melanie and said, oh, they, they have some significant responsibilities, and they may be somebody. I go into my house, I am nobody. I'm the youngest of seven children. <laughs> and it's like, I'm way down the, the thought process and then some of this. Totally cool. <laughs> totally cool. And I say that that's how it ought to be. Man, we're all part of this family. Yeah. And I want to encourage you to think about those people. Not so much about me. I want you to think about what's going on. Do we know what's happening? A family is really interested in these things. And, and at times, though, what can happen is that we can get very exclusive. There's a good part about exclusivity, we've talk, but some, I'm not as inclusive as we need to be. And sometimes we can take that metaphor a little too far. And you know how that shows itself? It's how we fellowship a church. Do we only fellowship people that we're so familiar with? I mean, think of, does that make a lot of sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. But when someone comes in, man, sometimes though we find people leaning against the wall because they don't know anyone here. Yeah. And this family, hey, I gotta take care of this, I gotta take, I, I get it, but we gotta be careful that we don't take it to the nth degree. In what we're trying to accomplish. So funny. When I stepped out of the ministry in 2013 for about a five year hiatus, my schedule was filled all the time. When I stepped out of the ministry, somehow I became deaf, blind, mute, and stupid. Because no one, it's like, where's the phone calls? It's somehow we have been dealt a DNA because someone is up here, there must be some kind of appointment and anointment. Study your Bible. There is no such thing. We're all equally anointed. We're all equally, that's what Christ has done. There is no high priest today. The only high priest is Christ. I am not your high priest. Right. Yeah. Melanie said that too quickly and too loudly. <laughs> it was from the heart. Yes. <laughs> you see, guys, what we have to do, what I have to do. Take, take back all that I said. I need, I need all. That. But I think we've got to understand theologically how this stuff works. I mean, I think it's important. You know what? Churches need to be less of cathedrals and perhaps more like a bar. It's not something to look at. I mean, a lot of people today, wow, oh, what a beautiful spectacle. And it may be, and somehow conceptualizing, that's the church, that's not the church. Remember when the world was in uproar? When there was a fire in Paris? And they collected three quarters of a billion dollars in a manner of moments. And we're struggling to feed some people in the Bahamas. Or in Kashmir, there are eight million people in jail, so to speak, right now. We've, and yet we have bought into these lies. 
And the whole idea is so that our, the veil can fall from our faces, the, 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 the scales in our eyes can fall and we can see. And not to be arrogant with what we see, but to be loving and compassionate about who we are and what Christ has done for us. And now that we are in the family of God. Amen. If you're anything like me, because I came from that background, when things were asked of, I didn't take it seriously from the pulpit. Because I didn't see myself as being a part of it. Even some of my nomenclature, oh, you guys, when I was referring to the church. What do you mean, you? I, I, I am the you guys. And so, the, so, so therefore, it's a real important thing, man. We, a family, when I talk to my kids or to my parents or my brothers and sisters especially, when there's something, even though it's not expressly stated, Oh, there's a need there. Let me find out more about it. Can you imagine that that's the way we are? There's a need here? Okay. How do I help? Okay. This is what needs help. And so this morning, I just want to encourage us to understand when God talks about the idea of a family how we ought to be with one another. It's riddled. As a matter of fact, one of the concepts that the Bible uses in terms of a family is that the church is what? The bride of Christ. Is there a more intimate relationship than a bride with her husband? Oftentimes, when the Bible talks about unfaithfulness, it talks about committing adultery when we're unfaithful to our God. That's the kind of language that is used. And the Bible says on, the, on that day, Christ will come back for her bride. Washed, clean, radiant. But you see, the problem is, there sometimes our marital relationship is not what it needs to be, and so that doesn't re resonate with us. I was awakened to a world that I never knew existed to this degree. When I went into the secular world to work, and I hear people talk about their spouses, <laughs> what? She is up. He is up. I wish he were dead. I, w I mean, it's like, are you serious? And so that idea, when most marriages today end up in divorce, and that's not to mention the ones that end in the heart and never ends in divorce. And so the idea sometimes of these concepts is difficult for us to grasp. And so the metaphor is lost on us. And so, in regard to our family, as we close here this morning, I want you to, th I want you to think about the idea of us being the family of God. And we've got to make sure that we are not of this mindset that the church perhaps even like a cinema we all love to go to the cinema and we just watch and we just get entertained I hope church is entertaining but it's not why we're here in every aspect I don't care if you're in the teen ministry. You have something to give. Yeah. Yeah. The encouragement and the way you serve and the way you give and the way you in, uh, talk to other people, you have no idea how encouraging that will be to have people see you dedicated 
or to camp with students, or you're single. It doesn't matter what capacity you're in. And so, when we think about the family of God, let's think about not reinforcing some unhealthy metaphors. And that's one of my responsibilities. Is to create a culture and an environment and to help do that where we're all part of a family. We're all part of the body. We understand we're the temple. And so my challenge for you today is this. God has designed the body just as he wanted them to be. Every place. If there's lacking something, he makes up for it. In the meanwhile, until he finds that which we need. I want to ask you a question. In the deep recesses of your heart, where nobody goes, even where you're scared to go sometimes, When you think about the church as a family, how does that resonate with you? And if it's a challenge, talk about it. Then I have another question. How can you help? How can you help? If you're somebody that just comes to be entertained. And, uh, uh, and I don't think necessarily that's our intention, but that's ultimately what happens. And let me tell you how the fruits of some of that, not exhaustive. We walk in just before church because we don't want a fellowship or we don't think about it. That's, that's more like it's before the service begins. Or what role do we play in making this work? Be careful of that sports metaphor. That where we're giving some of our money to watch people entertain us. But I'm asking you, as part of this family, How do you use what God has given you to build this family? And if this is not your family, I want to encourage you to find a place, wherever it is, and be that. But simply coming to be entertained, you're robbing yourself of nourishment. Because believe me, God's church will go on with or without you. And I don't say that to talk down to it, 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 with or without me. The gates of hell cannot prevail and will not prevail against this church. That's what the Bible teaches. We get to be a part of this. It's an honor. Let us not become a family where we're watching one person in the kitchen cooking, doing the dishes, making everything, or just a few. And so when we partake of the bread and of the wine, it is emblematic. You know what we're saying? This is what we're saying. When everybody's eating the same thing and drinking, we're all the same. We're all equally in need of the Christ. And we're thankful. It doesn't matter what education you have. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how good looking you are. It doesn't matter how much you weigh. It doesn't matter how straight your hair is. It doesn't matter how much hair you have. It doesn't matter how old your clothes are. It does, it, we're all saying, as the brothers and sisters come, come along, we're saying what we're acknowledging is this. In this family, we all need the Christ 
equally, not some more than others. And that's why we all share the same thing. Some bread is not more expensive than the other. Some wine is not more expensive than the other. We're all saying, at this moment in time, we're saying, God, we equally are in need of you. Please, please, I thank you, my God. And I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. And so with that understanding, let us pray to our Father. Our God, we're, we're humbled. God, why you have chosen us, I don't know. But I don't want to ask too many questions, if, just in case you change your mind. Amen. We love being your children. And Father, there are times that we don't live up to that which we expect. But thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for us giving us not just a second chance, but umpteenth of chances. We're thankful for ultimately the Christ who died for us. Thank you for his death because it meant life for us. And as we partake of this, these two emblems, the bread and the, the wine, we're thankful for the forgiveness of sins. And Father, with one mouth and with one heart, we acknowledge we all need you desperately. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.